So welcome everyone. I'm Jay Leibowitz. Um, I guess my official title is Executive in Residence for Public Service at Columbia's Data Science Institute. That's a mouthful. Um, and I actually joined recently, um, right after Labor Day. So I really have enjoyed uh, working with my colleagues uh, and meeting you all um, as students in our programs across the university. Um, I know we might have a, a, a few faces from outside Columbia, the more the merrier, so that's great. Um, so we're really thrilled to have our guests from the U.S. Digital Corps. One of the things we're trying to do uh, at Columbia is to further expose our students and even faculty to public service in different roles. And uh, the U.S. Digital Corps is a wonderful fellowship opportunity uh, for our students um, who will be graduating and uh, I won't go into specifics because I know that will be covered, but uh, one of our alums from Columbia um, actually is in the 2022 class of fellows, and I understand she's on her way between New York and Finland right now, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, she works at, at GSA, General Services Administration in Washington, and so it's just a wonderful opportunity for you all, and we thought you should be aware of um, of this particular fellowship, and hopefully uh, you'll have an interest in applying. So I'm going to pass the baton to Chris Kwan, and he is the U.S. Digital Corps co-lead, um, and he has a, a, at least two of his um, fellow colleagues who will also be part of the presentation in the question and answer period. So feel free to ask any questions in the chat. Uh, the presentation formally is about 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A, and we'll, we'll try to wrap things up at the top of the hour. Okay, so Chris, I'm going to um, uh, let you go ahead, and um, you can feel All free right. to share your screen and... Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay, and, and the entire uh, Data Science Institute at Columbia for having us. Uh, as he mentioned, my name is Chris Huang. I'm one of the co-leads here of the United States Digital Corps. I'm calling in today from Washington, D.C., and we're just tremendously excited to share a little bit more about this new program in case it's something that you might be interested in applying to and thinking about after you graduate uh, from your programs. And I know uh, they were mentioning we have folks probably across Columbia and perhaps uh, beyond the university. And it's always really fun and helpful for us to get a sense of who's in the room, either in person or virtually. And so if you could indulge me in just sharing a little bit about your background, what you're studying, you know, what year you're graduating, what you're interested in, anything that caught your eye about this session um, made you want to spend an hour with us in the chat. And I, I think that could be just really helpful for us to kind of calibrate and understand kind of what you're interested in. And so thanks in advance to anyone who, who shares there. But um, as Jay alluded to, I'm joined today by two wonderful colleagues, Diana Salazar Foreman and Meredith Brown, who will both introduce themselves shortly. Uh, we'll have an uh, overview. We'll make sure that you get these slides as well. We'll send them out to, to the coordinator, so no need to take kind of in-depth notes. Um, but we're, we're thrilled to be here. Um, again, we'll do an overview, plenty of time for questions, dive a little bit into a day in the life of a United States Digital Court Fellow with Meredith, and then plenty of time for questions. But in this first half of the presentation, I'm actually going to hand things over to my colleague, Diana, who will kick us, uh, get us going. But before that, uh, Diana, maybe we can do a quick round of introductions. Hello, everyone. My name, as Chris mentioned, is Diana Salazar Foreman, and I'm the communications and marketing lead here at the US Digital Core. My pronouns are she, her, and I am also in the Washington DC area in Alexandria, Virginia. And I'll pass it up to Chris. Um, yeah, 
I said hello already. This is me again. Uh, I guess one other quick word about my background in case it's of interest is I was a student in, in your shoes not that long ago looking for opportunities to blend an interest in technology and data and an interest in public policy and public service and just frankly did not find any opportunities at the time short of installing office software on government computers in an unpaid internship. And I thought there's got to be better opportunity kind of to blend tech and government. And so that has set me on a path uh, that has kind of ended up here today with the U.S. Digital Corps. So always fun to be back on a university campus uh, sharing about opportunities to do just that. Um, but before we dive in, uh, Meredith, do you want to say hello? Yes, for sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Meredith, as Chris mentioned. Um, I'm a current U.S. Digital Core Fellow in, our, in the inaugural cohort. Um, I am a Data and Analytics Fellow currently supporting the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, before joining the fellowship, I uh, was a student at Duke University. I studied uh, statistics and computer science, um, and I'm also calling in from the Washington DC area. So happy to be here and happy to share a bit about my experience today. Thanks for joining. Diana, over to you. Thank you, Chris and Meredith. And now let's start by telling you a bit about the program. So the program launched in August of last year, 2021. Uh, it, it was launched in, by the Biden and Harris administration to bring early career technologists to work in the federal government. We had other programs uh, that existed already for mid to senior level. You may have heard of 18F or the Presidential Innovation Fellows, but there wasn't anything for early career and we noticed that gap on the pipeline and we decided that and we need to do something about it. And so we, the Biden Harris administration in collaboration with the General Services Administration, uh, which is where we're housed. And within that, we're housing the Technology Information Services of TTS. And my heroes say TTS and GSA a lot. So that's what that means. Um, we created the program and it's a two year fellowship for early career technologists to serve um, here in the government and create in working projects that impact the American public. They, um, we work on projects, as I mentioned, um, all across the government and all across federal agencies. The fellows come and start a program here at GSA, but they are sent to work at other agencies across the government on um, areas that include economic recovery, racial equity, health, climate, COVID-19 response and customer experience. And next slide. Uh, our current cohort is placed at these 12 agencies. As you can see, they're all, all very diverse that um, target very different parts of the American public from environment to census, to Department of State, the VA, HHS, Health and Human Services. We have fellows working at all these great agencies. And I can give you some examples of the projects they're working on. So we have fellows working at the Health and Human Services, I mean, um, in services at the Administration for Children and Family, or ACF. And they're helping the Office of Refugee Resettlement uh, with the own, um, ensuring that unaccompanied minors at the border um, have an equitable equitable process when they come here and they're trying to find their families or sponsors. And it's across functional fellow teams. So we have a product manager, a designer, and a cybersecurity fellows working on this project, ensuring that the process is easier and equitable for these children. And then we also have fellows at the VA, as I mentioned, and they're working on making the process for veterans easier when they're trying to make an appointment or getting reminders from the VA. Instead of having to do it through a paper process that could be lengthy and sometimes confusing paper gets lost and all that kind of stuff. So they're trying to integrate text messaging and appointment reminders to make it easier and user-friendly for the veterans. 
And as well, it's also a multidisciplinary project. We have a product manager and a designer working on it. So next slide. And these are our current cohort of amazing fellows. We have 38 of them, and they all come from different countries and different states across the country. We have fellows here in this city like Meredith, but we have fellows as far as Hawaii. We have fellow working from Hawaii. So as you just heard, this is a opportunity for everyone. And it's also remote friendly. You don't have to work in the sea. And I can tell you a little bit more about that on the next slide. So who are we looking for? Digital Core Fellows are mission-driven junior technologists with a passion for public service. Um, we have uh, five tracks that we place fellows on, software engineer, data science and analytics, product management, design, and cybersecurity. And we also want to make sure that our fellows have, um, other than technical skills, they also have this um, communication the skills necessary to work in government. Um, Many of the people who are fellows work with might not be technical. Uh, you know, there could be the product um, subject matter experts on like policy or health or immigration that they work with to, on these projects. Who well, might not be as technical, like person like me. And our fellows want to make sure they're able to sort of translate technology for them, letting them know why we're building something with a certain tool or using a certain code, so that um the uh, or their agency partners can better understand what they're doing and feel more comfortable working on these projects and next slide oh there we are you're fast chris okay <laughs> as i mentioned location fellows can work remotely in person or in hybrid from anywhere in the united states and its territories and even our fellows who are here in dc um are also able to work from home as well and not just come in the office when needed. It also, it all depends on the agency you're placed. And also like all fair employees, you receive the same salary and benefits that we do and your uh, salary is based on your work location. Yep, and for example, for salary, someone in DC salary is over $80,000 and also, we offer career uh, growth opportunities. If you're, you're placed on a fast track uh, with a digital core fellowship. So after the two years fellowship, if you decide I love working in government, I love the impact my work is having with American public, I would like to continue working as a permanent federal employee. You will have the opportunity to stay and become a full from a full-time Kobe like I am. And next I'll pass it to Chris for fellow experience. Thank you so much, Diana. Uh, hopefully that was a helpful overview. It's uh, thank you to everyone who's dropped into the chat and just seeing some of the excitement around data science for social impact, data science in the government sphere. There's definitely a lot of work. You saw two examples there, the Administration for Children and Families and at the Department of Veterans Affairs that are more digital product focused. But we have Meredith here who will dive into the weeds and be able to share a little bit specifics of what uh, a day in the life of a data scientist in government looks like and uh, some of the work that she's doing supporting the White House um, infrastructure implementation work. But before we get to that, I wanted to share a little bit more about the fellow experience more broadly. There's high impact work to be had across all of the government. But again, to Diana's point, there's a focus on career growth, there's a focus on professional development. And I wanted to, to take a moment to share with you all some elements of what that looks like. So we do have uh, four buckets broadly. There's much more than this, but this is a, a helpful summary sometimes of some elements of the fellow experience. First and foremost is an orientation and onboarding. 83% of our fellows are first time federal employees. So if you're sitting out there thinking, well, I don't have any government experience, trust me, you would be kind of in the majority of folks who, who come into the program. And so there's a lot of thought behind in orientation, kind of a government 101 to help establish 
the tips and tricks and all the acronyms that you might need to be able to hit the ground running in your first few days, weeks, and months. From there, there's a dedicated learning and development curriculum that is being put together and that our fellows benefit from. It's curated specific to each of the five tracks that Diana mentioned. So if you're a data scientist, there's a great focus on how can we help you become a better data scientist and grow those technical skills, but also be connected with folks who are um, have those non-technical skills, kind of bureaucracy hacking chops, if you will. How can you be impactful in government? So the learning and development curriculum is really designed to help grow our fellows, both personally and professionally. On a mentorship aspect, that's a, a different dimension, but a very similar goal is how can we help you grow your professional network in the civic tech ecosystem? And so joining that community, being matched one-on-one -on -one and being able to answer questions or ask questions of people who just have slightly more experience in a broader network that are very willing to pay it forward and help you out. And last but not least, not just having a, a group of more senior and seasoned folks to help out as mentors, our fellows benefit so much from being a part of a peer cohort community. And so we have 38 fellows in this first class placed across 12 different agencies. And even though during the week, people are heads down on their specific projects and teams, they all come back at the end of this day to a broader community of fellows where they can share in the wins, commiserate in the challenges, and ultimately support each other in growing as civic technologists. So being a U.S. Digital Corps Fellow is a high-touch, 360-degree support model that we have. These are some of the elements there that we have really invested in creating space and opportunities for our fellows to build that community. Uh, we have a, a series called Fellow 15s at the end of our weekly All Hands, where a fellow has an opportunity to deliver a 15-minute uh, lightning talk on anything that they're personally or professionally curious, passionate, and excited about. Uh, we've had presentations as diverse as how do you build a board game to a cybersecurity 101 to someone who presented just yesterday about a you know, long distance bike journey they, did, they made from Pittsburgh to Washington, DC. So those are really fun opportunities for our fellows to get to know each other outside of the work that they're doing on behalf of the pe American people. We have many track specific examples as well, where all of our data scientists, and uh, Meredith, maybe this is something that will come up a little bit later, but have been participating in a discussion group called the Equitable Data Dialogue. Some of their data science fellows you see here on the slide have been participating. This is a series run out of the White House by the Chief Data Scientist of the United States, Denise Ross bringing together data science practitioners across government and sharing how they are using data to advance equitable outcomes across government. Uh, you have similar series and conversations that our cybersecurity fellows are having, our design fellows, and so to speak. And then we also have broader conversations that are cross-cutting the cohort. And so a discussion group with readings and podcasts and things to listen and react to around technology, ethics, and society, obviously core questions when you're serving the public, and then just more casual fellow organized events as well. And so our hope is not only are you gonna be working on high impact projects day to day on behalf of the American people, but that you're gonna find your people in doing so because government is a large enterprise. We have over 2 million federal employees. So it sometimes can feel easy to get lost in in the sauce of everything that's going on, but we really want to make sure that you've got those peers and that network to support you in that way. Obviously, in serving the public, we are guided by our core values of integrity, inclusion, and impact. This belief that one of our nation's greatest strengths is the diversity of our country along every which spectrum and axis. And so you saw a photo earlier of our first cohort, we're extremely proud that it is uh, an incredibly diverse cohort. We have majority women, majority people of color, uh, representing 20 states and territories across the country, as well as 
varied life experiences. So folks who just recently out of an undergraduate program, folks out of graduate programs, doctorates, veterans, career changers, parents, folks who are, are coming from many different backgrounds. And so we feel like the work that we do on behalf of various communities and the public is bolstered by the fact that you know, those very same people are empowered at the table through a program like the Digital Core. And so as such, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility have really been through lines in everything that we do and to how we do our recruitment, to how we design our selection process, and the types of projects and work that our fellows are doing. Every employee makes a difference when it comes to DEIA. And so all of our fellows, uh, Diana mentioned, sit within a broader organization called the Technology Transformation Services. And we have an active and influential diversity guild in the organization where they meet every week. And it's an open space where fellows join other employees and reflecting to events in the wider world, facilitating conversations about what the EIA might look like in a specific context or on a specific team, and just creating a space for, for those conversations and a space for action at the end of the day. Additionally, recognizing that people come first, there's a strong focus that we have in ensuring that everyone can show up to work every day as their true selves. And so one part of that are these affinity and employee resource groups that we have, which are voluntary groups self-organized by folks who are here that are arranged around either shared interests, identities, or dimensions, part of your personal background. And so you see an example here of some of them, but these are just open spaces, again, for community and support, uh, finding others who might share an aspect of your identity. On the flip side, we also have a, a number of communities of practice or guilds, uh, you might hear us refer to them as, and these are arranged around professional skill areas, sets of interests or ways that we're serving the public. And so we've got an accessibility guild, a DevOps guild, a security compliance, a artificial intelligence community of practice. There are a lot of these around that are great opportunities to take on a leadership role, to present the work that you're doing, keep up to date with best practices and connect with other practitioners. So there are plenty of ways to get involved outside of the day-to-day -day work at your agency. And I will kind of come back to this timeline in a second, um, but wanted to just share uh, Jay mentioned at the top that we we are really lucky to have a Columbia grad who's, I think, spent some time at the Data Science Institute, perhaps, but Anastasia, who is part of this inaugural cohort alongside Meredith, uh, working here at the General Services Administration on a team called 10X, and they are a federal incubator accelerator, if you will, open to any good ideas from the 2 million federal employees across government who might have an idea of how might we do this a little bit better. I think if we did X, we would improve the way that government serves the public. And so 10X has got a team of engineers, product managers, designers, data scientists to test and validate those ideas. They use an incremental stage phase-based funding model not unlike what you might see in a private sector setting, and they incubate ideas and help scale them to government-wide. And so she unfortunately could not be here today, but um, it was instrumental in, in putting this together. And then Meredith, um, who is here, Meredith will come back to you in a second, but I, I did want to um, go back to that timeline just because some of you, hopefully this is of interest and you're thinking, well, how can I get involved or engaged? Um, so we're right here now in the first week of November, we have started our recruitment. Our applications have yet to open, but they'll open very soon. Uh, once that happens, we do have a multi-stage selection process. It is the government. Uh, don't be scared off by some of the perception that it's a black hole or you'll never hear back or anything like that. We've put in a lot of work to make it as candidate and applicant friendly as possible. And so there's a resume review, there's a project-based assessment that's designed to take a couple of hours over the course of a week. 
you have an opportunity to interview with subject matter experts. And so if you're applying in the data science track, you would actually be speaking to data scientists and government as part of the process. Additionally, you apply centrally to the digital core, but obviously, and many of you have mentioned in the chat, you have particular interests, whether in the environment or in education or in biomedical research. And based on that, we kind of are able to help match and point you towards certain agency partners that are a really good fit for those backgrounds. So roughly January, February of 2023 is when those interviews happen. If those go really well, you'll end up being selected and you'll go through a security clearance. Onboarding is also not as scary as you think, but it does take some time. And then our fellows, our next cohort will start in June or July of 2023. Again, it's a cohort-based model. Everyone starts on the same day. So you've got that people in your community and you would be coming in as a second year fellow or a first year fellow, but you'll also have the support and, and the folks who've gone through it in the year prior as Meredith and, and Anastasia and some other folks head into year two. And so we'll definitely make sure that you get all of this info, this slide, this entire presentation. But the best way to know when those applications will open in the coming weeks is to uh, click on these links at the bottom. We've got a newsletter on our website, as well as a Twitter and, and LinkedIn. And if you subscribe and or follow, that's when you'll see when applications open. And one of the things that we do is at each stage along this way, we host additional info sessions with very specific details about that step in the process. So when the applications open and you're thinking about how do I put together a resume that is more government style than perhaps you'd see in the private sector, what should I put? How should I format it? We have a specific information session for that. If you're thinking about how should I prepare for the interview, we've got tips and tricks there to put your best foot forward. So again, all of that is communicated uh, through folks who who sign up on our website. And um, Diana, I don't know if you happen to have those links um, online, but you're able to, if you want to drop those in the chat, uh, while I kind of bring Meredith to the stage, um, that would be awesome. And so we're, we're about halfway through. I do want to save about 15 or 20 minutes for any kind of questions, reactions for the group. And so feel free to start thinking about those. I think Jay will help us moderate that. And you could raise your hand when the time comes or drop it in the chat. But before we get there, I uh, wanted to, to share a little bit about what a day in the life of a fellow and hear it not from Diana and not from me, but from a fellow herself. Uh, and so I'll stop sharing here. Meredith, you mentioned very briefly, you studied statistics and computer science at Duke. You're now working as a digital core fellow supporting the White House Office of Science and Education of science and technology policy. Sorry, I just tried to rename your office. Um, and, and I'm curious, you were on the other side of these info sessions not, not that long ago. And uh, what kind of caught your eye at that moment and kind of share with us a little bit about how you got from that position, what inspired you to apply and maybe a little bit about the work that, that you're doing now? Yeah, for sure. Um... But I think something that connects to, to some of y'all being in New York City, uh, going into my, my senior year of undergrad, I did an internship at Memorial Sloan Kettering, the cancer, cancer center in the city, um, working in their biostatistics department. And I was just absolutely set on doing biostatistics with my life. That's what I was going to do. I was ready for it. And I got to the end of the summer and I'd worked on this really awesome project with my PI looking at the pharmaceutical industry and where payments had gone. And we had some really interesting findings and we went to publish and he sort of said, okay, great, let's move on to the next thing. And I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean we're just gonna move on? We're not gonna talk to somebody about these findings that we have or you know, any sort of uh, changes that we wanna make to policy so that these things can't happen. And some wise, wise mentors in my life at the time said, you know, if you want to make those changes, you've got to join the government. That's sort of, that's sort of how that happens. And so I began to look for various opportunities to 
join local government, to join campaigns, and thankfully came across the Digital Core. And it's such an incredible opportunity, as Chris mentioned, to have both mentorship in so many ways, but also to have a community of other folks that are starting out their careers um, and have the same interest as you and um, all come from very different backgrounds. It's just a lovely community to be a part of. Um, and that's sort of how I how I ended up here. Um, Chris, I hope that answered your question. I didn't know if there's anything else there. No, it, it did. And I don't even know that I've, I've heard that story in that manner before, but it's such a awesome responsibility and opportunity to be here in kind of quote unquote the rooms where it happens and, and to be able to play an active role in shaping and changing the policy or often how that policy is implemented and making sure that we're doing that in a fair and equitable way. And so Meredith, uh, Diana mentioned that all of our digital core fellows technically kind of our GSA employees, but many of them are supporting other agencies. About 80 to 90% of our fellows time are spent with those host agencies and teams. The remaining 10 to 20% are as a cohort. And so weekly all hands, fellow driven programming, opportunities to chat with mentors and all of that. But uh, maybe let's focus in on that 80 or 90% first. Um, you, you mentioned you're, you're working on a team in the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House under the Chief Data Scientist of the United States, Denise Ross. What are you doing? What, what is that work? And also just maybe uh, what does, what has working kind of with a White House team on a White House team felt like and kind of reflect on that opportunity a little bit as well? Yes, for sure. Um, Yes, when I got the email saying that I was going to be working for the chief data scientist of the United States, I did think it was a joke. I didn't know that that was a real thing that someone could do. Um, but it's been just the dream job. Um, so our office is focused, as Chris mentioned, we're part of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which has lots of different functions from supporting NASA's work running into asteroids to divert them all the way to equitably Im implementing the administration's policy. Um, and so we sit within the chief technology office. And so we work more on the latter focus there. Um, and so primarily when I came in, uh, I've been working on the implementation of the bipartisan infrastructure law, which got passed about a year ago now, um, and is the largest investment in infrastructure in, in decades, um, $1.5 trillion to go across the country. Um, and so, uh, I work every day on, on kind of stakeholder engagement and coordinating with different agencies, communicating with folks at the White House to make sure that everyone is on the same page. And a lot of that is very data driven. You know, policy doesn't come out of nowhere. You have to have the data to back that up. And so it's been really awesome to get a really good understanding of how federal government's data works and who they have to submit it to and by when and how it works and how it all fits together. Um, so day to day, I get to just wrangle that and and uh, communicate the findings to folks and 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 then have them, you know, ask really important questions like are going to get to inform their policy. And so it's definitely been very surreal to be um, in a place where you feel like you're really impacting people's lives with your work. But uh, it makes me excited to go in every day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. I do want to tease out one thing that you're saying there, which is there's obviously a lot of data flying around when you work with the chief data scientist and, and with the skill set that you have and the background that you have. But this is also probably not an opportunity for someone who is very happy exclusively working with data and wants to communicate solely with numbers and, and scripts and code because there's a lot of other work that happens too. And so what is what has that balance been like for you? Kind of the the data, the data all all the data things and then all of the kind of policy, the bureaucracy hacking, because I think sometimes we we have folks who come in who say, well, all I want to do is kind of be heads down in the data and not do anything else. And maybe this isn't kind of the right type of opportunity just because the nature of the work does require more than that. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think Diana mentioned it earlier, but not everybody that you're working with has a technical background, you know, folks find their way into government for many different reasons. Um, and so when you go into these 
meetings with folks and you're presenting your graphs and you're presenting your findings, a lot of times the question I get is, so what's the story? What does this tell us? And I, I don't think I was aware coming out of just the importance of scientific communication and being able to take numbers and rows and columns and turn them into a one sentence summary of, because we did this, we were able to improve folks' lives in this area by this amount because of this action. Those are the sentences that drive communication, that drive policy, that drive decisions. And it all comes back to being able to, to wrangle it on my end. So it's a lot of communication of what are you seeing, but also being able to explain to folks why you need the data. People are very, uh, I don't want to use the word gatekeepy, but uh, they like to gatekeep their work, especially when you come in with the with the White House hat on, they, they get very sensitive to what you're asking of them. And so communicating why it's important to people and, and what you need to show and ultimately always turning back to you're delivering for the American public. And so you want to be able to actually show where their dollars are going and show where the shovels are in the ground and where work is happening. Um, and so, yeah, it, 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 the work is all across the board. And thank you for pointing out, Chris, it's definitely not all data work, um, right. but but it's very exciting if you're if you're passionate about kind of an interdisciplinary job, for sure. I, I once heard someone describe the work as being a translator. I mean, obviously it's all English, but when you're working with other data scientists, you you could be talking k nearest neighbors, error rates, R squared, all these things that you know, everyone here being at the Data Science Institute probably is very fluent in, but then you're working with policymakers who care about, well, how are we feeding children? And they could care less like how you've built a model. They care about what what does the model say and what does it mean for the work that we're doing? And so being fluent in both of those, being able to translate back and forth between technical and non-technical stakeholders is important because in government, the technology and the data do not exist for their own sake. They exist for the purpose of solving a problem or, or serving the public. And those are things that we think a lot about and honestly are part of the, the screening process, things that we look for in, in folks who are comfortable navigating in multiple spaces and in spaces where you know, they're surrounded by folks with other backgrounds. And you want to maybe ask Meredith one more question before we open it up. I, I've been seeing kind of some questions filter in and I'm sure there's more out there, but We've talked a little bit about the work and what that looks like on a day to day. Obviously, our fellows do have 10, 15, 20 percent of the time to, to be with the other fellows. And would love to just hear some reflection on that. What you expected coming in? Has it been you know, these other fellows? It's a hybrid world. And there's some folks that are in D.C., some folks all across the country. And just talk to talk a little bit about, you know, any of the bonds that you've been able to build or you know, reflection on the, the cohort model of the digital core? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm a huge fan of the cohort model. Um, being a fellow in DC, it's been just so great to have other fellows to lean on. As I mentioned earlier, just being able to have a community of other folks who are early in their career and, and are facing some of the similar kind of you know, imposter syndrome in syndrome challenges and, and, you know, is this just something because I'm earlier in my career? Or is this something I just don't understand? Um, and being able to bounce those ideas off of other people that are experienced in other agencies and to hear their perspective and, and just have a kind of a community that's there to support you no matter what has just been lovely. And as Chris mentioned um, earlier, we've had different track specific things. And so one of those is for the data science fellows, my office has sponsored um, some equitable data dialogues to talk about how we as a federal government are responding to the executive order that went out on day one about equitable data. Um, and it's been great just to have the other data science fellows there to talk about the work at their agencies, to hear from other both mentors from, from within our agencies, from outside of the federal government, um, to exchange ideas, um, and to have us all there together. It, it's you know such a strong show of the ways that we're changing the government and are working hard to address these challenges. So I think the cohort is one of the best parts of this experience for sure, because you're not going through it alone. This is what I get for trying to multitask. I was trying to drop a link about the uh, the 
equitable data executive order that that you mentioned in case folks were interested in in looking at it. But Jay, I know we've got just about 15 or 20 minutes left and uh, I'm sure we've stirred up a bunch of questions. Uh, I think myself, Meredith, Diana, all happy, all happy to to talk about the opportunity, the the experience as a fellow, um, or, or anything else that might be on folks' minds. Perfect. And and so we'll open up the uh, questions to the floor uh, for anyone you know who has any uh, questions. And Chris and Diana. And and Meredith, uh, as I put in the chat, I wish, I wish I had this opportunity when I first started my career. Um, I, I've been uh, the knowledge management officer at NASA Goddard and other places, but what a what a wonderful program! So um, I'm hoping uh, all the students, as part of this um, uh, session, you know, will certainly follow up with you all. So um, I was noticing in the chat, it looked like most of the questions were answered. So if you have any question, just raise your hand or put it in the chat. Um, uh, you might be interested in knowing a little more about the selection process, perhaps, you know, what are some of the key criteria? Um, you know, I'll leave it, I'll leave it up to all of you. So I think uh, Chris Devin has a question about how does yes. a fellow differ from a full-time employee and what's the weekly time expectation for a fellow? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Devin. And, and this is something that is an, a, a common point of confusion. I think fellow means just about anything and or everything to, to different people, depending on who you ask and the context. And so in the case of the US Digital Corps, our fellows are full-time federal employees. This is kind of their full-time job. They're earning a, a salary. They're receiving benefits. And we call it a fellowship because it's a, a two-year program. It's kind of time-bound in that sense. Uh, but during, during the fellowship, it is a full-time experience. As we mentioned, our fellows spend about 80 or 90% of their time on any given week on average on their host agencies, so working with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services or the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. You can find more information about each of those projects on our website. The remaining 10 to 20 percent is spent in community with the other fellows. I like to call them your fellow fellows across the program and doing so, but the Digital Corps is a full-time opportunity. One thing that uh, Diana mentioned that is worth emphasizing is there have been other fellowships in government that are term limited. So this is a two year program, but many of those come at the end of the two years without a natural next step. Uh, you often are showed the door and and kind of said thank you for your service, but there's not a natural continuation point. Whereas with the digital core, we've done a lot of work in making sure that our fellows can stay on at the end of two years in permanent career government roles if they so choose. And so there is a hypothesis that many people will find this work engaging, compelling, impactful, and want to stay beyond two years, and, and they'll be able to convert into a permanent position. But in our case, uh, a fellow is just kind of a designation for uh, all of the folks in the program. It is a, a full-time career opportunity. Um, just to reiterate, Diana mentioned folks can work anywhere across the country. You don't have to move to DC. Anastasia, I believe, uh, moved recently to Denver. Um, we have folks all across the country. Um, your salary does depend on your location, but it's competitive um, based on kind of the same pay scale. And so uh, as an example, an entry level or a fellow in their first year has a salary north of $80,000 here in DC. And because of the career trajectory, that grows uh, significantly. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say that the, uh, the work-life balance in government tends to be much more kind of reliably kind of consistent than it is in the private sector. Our benefits are significant as well in terms of um, competitive insurance and benefits packages, time off, family leave, all of that good stuff. So um, I, I also, Chris, want to chime in because, you know, of course, it's always hard to compete with industry salaries in the data science or cyber area. But in my own experience, um, you get much more uh, greater roles and responsibilities 
an ultimate uh, experience by working with the government than you would in, in comparable roles in industry. And even hearing Meredith, I mean, imagine working for the country's chief data scientists at a young age, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, your years of experience. I mean, where, where else can you get some of that, um, uh, you know, wonderful uh, insights? And so, so it really, the experience that you get is just uh, phenomenal. And uh, I know that's been true in my case. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think like one other thing, one other thing that I'll add in here is it's been such a warm, uh, welcoming community in terms of the professional network and, and relationships that our fellows are able to tap into. And I think Meredith, you mentioned some of your mentors and the folks that you're working with. We see one of the great kind of lasting uh, things that folks get out of a program like this one is the people that they meet and often they are able to kind of continue working together in different roles, different agencies, or even in the private sector beyond that. So it's really a foundation for a, a professional network uh, that that is valuable. Um, I, I see another question in the chat about um, are are there opportunities where the cohort will meet in person? And I know we actually Meredith just came out on one of those. And do you want to share a little bit about I guess that from from your perspective? And then I'm happy to fill in any gaps. Yes. So we meet in person about once a quarter. So we were all in person in DC. Um, for our orientation. And then uh, about two weeks ago, we were all in DC again for, for this time. And then I will say uh, a decent amount of us in the cohort are in DC. And so we uh, will go to happy hours together or um, all go into the GSA office since that's kind of our central location that we're all uh, grouped under. And so we'll all go in there to work together and attend all hands together. Um, there are lots of ways to to be in person for sure. I would say I think the flexibility of not mandating people move was really important to us. We think it opens up the opportunity to many more people, but we all know the value of building those community ties together. And so often when we do bring folks together in person, the first few times have happened to be in Washington, D.C., but we're actively looking to diversify where we meet as a group across the country. So not everyone is traveling kind of the same way each time. And, and so when we do travel, it's less of a, hey, Chris is going to stand up the front of the room and, and kind of deliver things that he could have done on Zoom. But it's how do we create space for the fellows to really replenish and re-nourish those community bonds? And, and so that's uh, very important to us. There are also opportunities on the professional growth side uh, for conferences and travel. That's work-related travel. Our fellows have traveled for projects um, domestically, even internationally, fellows working at the State Department. And so there are plenty of opportunities to engage um, in various ways. Chris, um, I um, I learned recently that about, I think there are around two, you can correct me, 2.1 million federal civil, civil servants. And what I didn't realize, and I'm a Washingtonian, that 85% of the civil servants in the government work outside of Washington. This is before, you know, COVID and telecommuting and whatnot. So I was, um, I was astounded. S since um, uh, some of the students might be shy. Uh, so I'm going to ask some data-driven questions and uh, not to put you on the spot, but can you tell us at least, uh, I know the program's fairly new, but yes. um, what what is, um, you know, in terms of the number of people applying and, uh, you know, what percent typically might be accepted? And, and again, what are your criteria typically for selection? Yeah, I'll, I'll work backwards, and it would be remiss to, to leave the Data Science Institute without talking to some hard numbers. But as we mentioned, some of the selection criteria, things that we've talked about all along, right? It's are you mission driven, dedicated, interested in, in serving the public? Is first and foremost, are you here for the right reason? Uh, we find that many people, right, you all included, are, are drawn to that and is compelling which is fantastic. We're obviously looking for 
that technical foundation and expertise, whether it's in data science or any of our four other tracks, cybersecurity, product management, you apply in a track, but our fellows do a lot of interdisciplinary work. You heard Meredith talk about policy writing, communications. Often our product managers are doing things that might look like designers if they cared about kind of black and white lines. But again, everyone's doing what they need to to get the job done and to serve the public. And so that let's get it done. Uh, I'm going to contribute attitude is really strong. We do recognize that it's an early career program, and so we're not looking for folks to be subject matter experts, but we do expect them to be able to kind of hold their own in that field and be able to hit the ground running and contribute on their team. So it is a fine balance there. Um, and again, some of that resilience and adversity and how do you kind of navigate large organizations and sometimes the bureaucracy deals you a couple of punches and, and can you can you ride those out and, and continue working? We're looking for some of that grit in the selection process as well. And so those are some of the things that we look for. But again, if you are so interested and you end up attending kind of our very specific info sessions, Meredith, I don't know if you attended any of those last year, but hopefully they were helpful in that we try to I like to think of it as an open book test, right? In government, everyone gets a fair shake. There's no, we're only going to review the resumes of the people that went to Columbia, I'm sorry, um, or, or anything like that. But everyone kind of comes in the pro comes in the front door, in the same part of the funnel. But it's an open book test. We're really open about what we're looking for, how you can put your best foot forward. And we're very transparent about that on our website and in these info sessions. Um, speaking to the the program, being a small program, we had about 38 fellows in this first class. We have a vision of hiring hundreds, if not thousands of fellows a year as part of the United States Digital Corp. Part of that is just the scale of the need in government is significant. Uh, one data point that you see frequently, and Jay, that's one that consistently blows my mind too, is how much of the government is not in D.C., uh, one that is related to technology and data is of the federal workforce in technology and data, only 3% of that workforce is under the age of 30, and a third is eligible to retire in the next five years. So just thinking about the rapid pace of technological development, making sure that we have folks with the best and brightest skills, but also preventing that loss of institutional knowledge and human capital and not being able to replenish it is a big concern. And so that speaks to the scale of our ambition with the digital core. Obviously, you can't start at hundreds or thousands. We preach a lot about being agile and iterative. And so we're starting with small cohorts to test our hypotheses and all of that. And so to get to hard numbers, not to dodge the question, we had a little over a thousand applicants in this first cohort last year. Um, we selected 38, so you can do the math on, on an acceptance rate there. We anticipate uh, larger and larger cohorts to come and more and more opportunities. And the constraint in our first year was really that Diana and myself were about half of the team that we had trying to get this program off the ground. We'd never done it before. And so there wasn't an interest or a desire to bite off more than we can chew. But the team is growing. The, the fellows, Meredith and, and everyone else have proven that this is really an important program. And so we only expect to have uh, larger and larger cohorts, hopefully, from here on out. So uh, more to come. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Chris. Are there any other questions or, or comments for our guests? Uh, Sarath, looks like you have a question. Yeah, um, yeah, just really quickly. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, for the agency like placement process, uh, how does that work? And say you're placing an agency that maybe wasn't your preference. Are you able to switch out or are you kind of there? For their yeah, um, it, it is a, a two-sided matching process. So at no point in time do I wake up in the morning like, hey, Sarath, you are going to the Department of Justice and, and you have no say in that. Um, so it is a, a dual-sided process in that you apply centrally, say, in the data science track. We kind of 
funnel down that pool to a, a group of finalists who have kind of the fundamentals of what it need, what it means to be a data scientist. But as we all know, there are different flavors of data science and data analytics. You can have folks that are more on the machine learning side, more on the visualization analysis side, data journalism, and some of that communication pieces. And so based on your specific flavor of background, interest, and experience, we also look for our agency partners. They let us know what specifically they are looking for. Sometimes it's a tech stack that they're working in. Uh, we have been talking to agencies recently who say, I would really love a data scientist or data engineer, all the better if they have experience with education data or they know economic policy analysis or they can do biomedical data. And so based on some of that more specificity, we're able to say, well, here are a subset of candidates that have exactly what you're looking for. And so you would have an opportunity to interview with those agencies that are a good fit for your specific background. And based on that, um, you could say, hey, that's not a good fit for me, or hey, I'm interested in this. Um, but at no point in our application process is there a question that says, well, what agencies are you interested in working in? We've done that. I've done that in the past with a similar program and found that 75, 80% of people just pick the State Department, not because they all were interested in foreign policy, but they'd heard about it on the news, which is more than they could say about an agency like the General Services Administration, which I bet uh, for folks here, a few of you have likely come across in your time, but as Diana, myself, Meredith know, GSA plays such a key role in so many technology endeavors. So we kind of are really trying to optimize for impact across your skill area. So it is kind of a, a two-way conversation um, and, and you have a say in it. And uh, Meredith, I guess it wasn't a joke that you ended up at the White House with um, OSTP. So there, there's some really great placements that, that we're constantly excited about. I know Diana, you've shared that in, in the chat as well. Um, let's see, I, I think I saw a question from Kai. Um, yes, um, about climate. There's so much work in, in climate work that, that is happening. Obviously, big pieces of legislation that have passed recently um, that are climate focused. Uh, we have fellows who are currently working at the EPA, albeit more on the cybersecurity side than on the data science side, but not because there's any shortage of work. And so even though in our application process, there's not a, what agency do you wanna work for? There is an opportunity to let us know, hey, these are the types of things that are of interest. And so if you're interested in climate, that would be something but climate gets handled at every agency. In fact, GSA has a huge climate uh, role to play in that the GSA is the federal landlord, which is the largest landlord in the world based on kind of the number of buildings we own, operate, and lease. And there's work in electrifying all of that. We have the largest federal, we have the largest fleet of vehicles that is being electrified. And so oftentimes uh, when people say, hey, I'm interested in this topic, they might even end up in an agency that does that, even though that's not kind of what you think of. And so there's definitely an opportunity to do that as well. Um, Wonderful. So I, I want to be mindful of everyone's time and I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, but Chris, if, if anyone has any follow-up questions, yeah. uh, do you mind putting your email in the chat or the best way to contact you all and, while Chris is doing that, I want to thank uh, Chris, Diana, and Meredith, and also my colleagues, uh, John uh, Hyde and, and others at Columbia. And I want to thank all of you for attending. Uh, I would encourage you to apply. It's just a wonderful opportunity. And I'm so glad uh, to see that uh, you hopefully can play a, a role in, in continuing to uh, shape our country. So. Um, Yes. Thank, you. Thank you for having us. Please do reach out. Either of those email addresses will we'll find their way to me and our team. Um, and, and we'll hope to have some folks from some more folks from Columbia, NYU, uh, New York.